Hello and welcome to the Wikipaka stage on the dining room. It is 9 p.m. prime time. We are live with translation. And Bleepreg and Blinry are here and have now the third edition of Operation Mindfuck. And it's going to be very fun. Funny. Have fun. All right. We also say. Good evening, we are so glad that you're all here. Hello to the stream. Hello to the Wikipaka living room where some people might also be sitting. So this room is a pretty full, so it's nice that you're all sitting together. We have art, computers and curious things here. So we'll um, switch sides all every now and again and uh, we'll start with Blinri. Okay, I'm starting with chess variants. So a few months ago, I was at the MMCD in Darmstadt, and there was a presentation about medieval board games, and one of the board games that was shown was this one. It has Spanish roots. I can't speak uh, medieval Spanish, but maybe it's Grand Asedrex or something. It means Grand Chess. And if you know a chess of today and compare it, this is a 12 by 12 board, so it's larger, and the f figures are a bit weird, so there's a giraffe. And I think this thing here next to the king is the elephant bird, for example. And they have very weird movement patterns, which we don't know with our standard figures. So the giraffe, for example, moves two fields diagonally and then one straight, no, three fields diagonally and one um, horizontally. So that's kind of like the horse today. And the elephant bird goes one diagonal and then continues to slide as far as it wants, which is pretty weird. And now there, it turns out there is a whole community behind chess variants like this, uh, which includes fairy chess pieces. So there are lists where people uh, think up these things and um, throw it together and make up new chess variants. And I thought that was pretty impressive. This game, so here the rooks uh, move normally and the row at the bottom has these weird rows. Uh, weird figures, and to accelerate the game a bit, there's also the rule that you have an extra dice uh, determining with which kind of figures you can move. Another chess variant is losing chess, and the objective is to lose all of your own figures as fast as possible. And if you have to, if you can um, take another figure, you have to but you can choose which one if you have multiple options. And the king doesn't have a special status, it's a normal figure like the others, it can be beaten, and there's no um, checkmate. And whoever loses their figures first wins the game, which has some weird effects. So if you make a move, you create weird chain reactions because both players have to beat another figure and they can't stop. And in this gift that's playing all the time, the rook is played first, so I think d3, and that's a very bad move because then black can always win, it turns out. So people modeled this and did the math, and there's a sequence for black which forces that black is going to lose all the figure. So there are some openings that are a really bad idea. Right. Infinite chess has the usual figures in the usual arrangement, but the board is infinitely large. So that's more a kind of theoretical model. I'm not, I don't know if people actually play this. It's kind of difficult in the real world, but people think about how this works and if you can find out things about it. So you have a weird situation where you have to move one million fields with the queen upwards, and then it'll take the rooks a while to catch up. So it's weird to analyze. There are people who investigate this and found out that uh, given a certain arrangement and a number n, you can determine if there's a possibility for the current player to win within n moves, which is a pretty cool result, but it's not very useful uh, to write artificial intelligence or something, because what you really want to do is to figure out if from this position you can win at all. So if you know I can win in 10 moves, that's kind of not that useful if it means like you have to move a million 
fills up with the queen, so it might take a while until things happen. So it's a theoretical, uh, has theoretical value. There's also blind chess, which is, so you might know blindfolded chess, where people actually blindfold their eyes, and then they're told which moves happen, and they have to memorize where each figure is and what they want to do. So blind chess is different. So both players are in front of a board, and so they don't see the figures of the other color, only their own, and they don't get told what happens, so they have to infer that, uh, cautiously move their own figures and try things out, and then they're told if it's an illegal move, then they can try something else, so they can explore the field, uh, what the positions of the other player might be and try to find your own good strategy. So that means you need a third p person who uh, communicates between the two players and watches out that nothing illegal takes place. I checked and there's a very uh, defined set of words which this third person can use, which is, for example, no if it's not a legal move, like if you try to move across another figure, or if you make a move which is independently, uh, so not possible independently of the other player's figures, then you say hell no. And this is a small website. Oh, I actually have to click out of this presentation. So let's take a look. This was written by a human called Pippin Barr, who also builds other interesting game prototypes. And so these are chess variants you can actually try out. And one I really like is uh, quantum chess. So you don't get told what the rules are. You have to find out by trial and error. So let's try to make a move with a rook. Oh, we have two rooks now. So it's black's move. So there's no artificial intelligence. So two people move against each other. And the system checks that the rules are um, followed. So if you make a move, the figure moves to all the possible positions. And now we have a lot of queens, for example, which might be useful. Maybe it's also uh, a disturbance. So that's quantum chess. I also wanted to show you gravity chess. <laughs> so let's try to make a move. And are you already laughing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, and so on, and then all the figures <laughs> fall down, and you can play this, and someone tweeted this, and other people try to actually play this, and analyze final positions of this game where you can not do very much, and it's really cool, I think. And last but not least, I wanted to show you chess boxing. You might have heard of this one. It's an actual sport, a serious sport, started as an art project because someone thought, oh, wouldn't it be funny if people had to box and play chess at the same time, or s uh, alternatingly, and it became really popular, and there are now chess boxing associations which organize championships, so it works like this, it's in rounds, you play three minutes of chess, and then you box for three minutes, and you alternate, and you can win by knocking out your opponent, or by checkmating them. And the rules also say that you can give up. And it's it says you can give up in the chess part or in the boxing part. So, yeah, that's funny. All right. One thing that occupied me a lot in the uh, past few months is uh, Twitter bots, uh, mainly artsy Twitter bots. A Twitter bot is normally uh, simply a Twitter account that's um, <laughs> where posts are written by a, by a program, sometimes once a day, sometimes several times a day. Um, and I'm going to show you some of my favorite Twitter bots. One of them is very simple. It's endless screaming, and it never posts anything other than ah in varying uh, lengths, which is very important. Another one is Big Ben Clock. It's quite similar. It uh, simply uh, spells out the beats of uh, Big Ben, of course, at the right times. Um, 
Another one that's very nice is choose to accept. It gives you secret missions that it uh, randomly generates. One of them is your mission, should you cho choose to accept it, is to sneak into the casino of Colin the hairstylist. is there. You must steal the Horn of Plenty, Melvin, the Renter Mob, inflate Colin and finally escape using a secret tunnel. It tends to be a bit um, confused and it's generated from a grammar and from uh, uh, building blocks. Um, there's the cocktail bot as well, it, or the bot cocktails, and it um, builds, builds funny cocktails from uh, random ingredients, and it's interactive, so you can tweet to it. Um, so you can tell it, mix me something, and then it uh, thinks of a of a cocktail name and uh, <laughs> no, we don't currently want to update Linux um, and it uh, gives you a recipe for a cocktail. And another fun thing is that you can ask it to, su uh, to surprise you and then it'll tweet you, it'll generate a random cocktail. And then there's Amazing Bot or Amazing Bot and it generates uh, mazes and you can play them. It looks like this and then underneath the tweet you can reply with the direction. So for example, up or down are the only uh, directions that currently make sense and when you tweet at it, then it will reply with a, with a picture of the new state. So you can uh, collaboratively, collaboratively solve a, a maze such as this. And another one that I really like is the Nixie bot. Um, I'm not sure who built it, but somebody built this uh, Nixie tube setup and you can tweet at the bot with, oh no, with a text and then uh, it'll uh, be shown on these tubes. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, filmed by a raspy cam. It and then you get a uh, get a get a moving image uh, of your text. It usually takes a few minutes, and um, it's very nice because the person who owns this Nixie bot uh, likes to decorate decorate the tubes, and um, you can also see what time of day it is. It's uh, very much alive, and the bot likes to post a daily review where everything that happened over the course of a day is uh, collected in a in a large video and it'll be posted once a day. So um, I can very much recommend that you tweet at this bot. Finally, I want to show you one of my bots, which um, I built. It's not on Twitter, it's on Macedon. It's the uh, Turitafe bot, so the Turi touristic sign uh, bot. These, those are the signs that you know from the uh, side of the autobahn or the highway and they tend to be a bit obscure and uh, tell you what uh, a particularly region, particular region or city might be famous for. And I built a bot that generates this kind of sign. It fetches data from two databases. Wikidata, if, you, if you're if you in the Wikipaka VG, then you probably know Wikidata. It's a sister project of Wikipedia, but it's a machine-readable database, and I fetch um, city names and object names from Wikidata. So these are real objects and cities or places, and then I uh, fetch an icon from the Noun project, which is a collection of SVG uh, graphics that you can use. And then my bots, bot builds um, an image that looks roughly like one of these signs. And these tend to, tend to be quite obscure. There might, for example, be the uh, chips or fries museum. Um, actually, all of these happen to be museums. They're, that's not usually the case. You can uh, also get something like the uh, like the. Uh, Spherical City Magdeburg or the Bowl City Magdeburg and um, this bot is on Magdeburg due to a very interesting story. Um, a while ago Twitter ended, uh, changed its API and it's become a lot more difficult to get an API key for Twitter. You need to fill out a form of what you want to use your Twitter account for and uh, Twitter would, is very reluctant to hand out these keys and this 
really shook up the scene because it's become difficult to build these bots and because older bots are no longer functional. And um, it brings up debates of uh, how we should maybe deal with archiving if things we built once upon a time can stop working at some point. And um, the uh, solution that many people found is Mastodon, which is a decentralized Twitter alternative. And there's a separate instance for this kind of bots. It's called botsin.space. And this uh, has become a home for lots of these artsy uh, Twitter or not Twitter Mastodon bots. Um, I can highly recommend clicking through these. There are lots of fun projects. And if you fancy building uh, your own bot, then there are some projects I can recommend. There's BotWiki, which is a wiki that collects uh, bot variants. Uh, you can click through it, but it's not very complete yet. If you find a bot that you very much like, then you can um, you can uh, add it to this wiki. But otherwise, you can just click through it and find get inspired by what other people build. There are bots that um, write poems or music and there's lots to discover. If you want to build one yourself, then there's uh, Cheap Bots Done Quick, which is a website that uh, lets you host bots without a lot of prior knowledge. And you can um, also use Tracery, which is a tool that makes it very easy to build grammars, for example, to generate uh, texts or images. If you're even more interested, then um, I'm afraid I don't have a link for it, but you can uh, check Blinry's blog. He um, gave a workshop on this that was unfortunately not recorded, but you can find the slides on B Blinry's blog, and uh, he explains where exa uh, how exactly this works. Next up will be ray marching and sign distance functions. That sounds rather scary, but I'll tell you how I came about working with this. We had been around three years ago on a demo party in Cologne. That's uh, kind of a meetup where several hundred people come together and sit together in dark homes, halls and sit on their laptops and code. And they are coding videos. They're coding little snippets that uh, generate or do rather interesting graphical and graphical uh, things. There are several categories in which they can uh, sign up for. And one of them is a restriction for the program that you're writing, that the program must not exceed a certain size, certain file size, for example, five kilo uh, four kilobytes, uh, which I think is very, very little, just a few lines of code. And the challenge is to do cool things with this size restriction. What might come out of that is uh, like this here, like a 4K demo from the Evoke, which contains rather interesting complex geometries. Let's look into this. You'll see those haze effects, fog effects. Interesting line of sight for the camera. You are flying through a fractal geometry. Let's skip ahead. There are things moving in this world. And oh, by the way, there's music in there that's also been generated by the code in this moment. It's all running live. So this the surface is kind of shiny. And I was sitting there, mouth agape, and thought, uh, how are they doing this with such little code generating such complex uh, shows. So I looked into it on the way back on the train and what I came across was fragment shaders. This is an OpenGL thing, which is about writing a rather little, li rather small program and uh, that is executed for each pixel on the screen. So you put in the coordinates of the pixels and the uh, program calculates uh, where the where the program uh, where the pixels have to go so if you've got to if you do this correctly this can be highly parallelized on your graphics card so that's what this technology is for so i found this book online the book of shaders which uh, calls itself a gentle step-by-step -step guide uh, through the abstract and complex universe of fragment shaders i can highly recommend that which takes you by the hand and shows you how everything is done and how to generate more complex geometries. But 
But this only generates two d uh, two dimensional graphics. So you cannot create the demos that we've just seen. So I went on and uh, found some other ways, some other ways to generate 3D graphics. What I've heard of already in university, but some of you have may have heard already also, is ray tracing. So if you want to generate a picture that's uh, that consists of of, of pixels, you shoot a ray of light from the camera to each part of the scene where there might be little balls or more complex geometries and you look at where this ray from the camera comes upon an object and then you can calculate uh, where is this object, uh, are there shadows, is this lighted in a particular way and uh, you end up with uh, pixels. That, that's a pretty cool way to render three-dimensional pictures, for example, glass objects or soft shadow effects. That's a technique that's been around for quite a while. But it's got a problem, because if you've got a more complex geometry, those uh, intersections are quite quite hard to find out. So that's, that's not really feasible for live demos. So what we're doing here is a technique called ray marching. I've never heard of that before. So what you're doing is to define a mathematical function and for each point in the room, it gives you back the distance to the next point, to the next surface. In this example, it's two-dimensional, but uh, it also works in three dimensions. So you insert some point and uh, the, the function returns you that the next point might be one meter f away. And if you shoot a ray in there and the next surface is one meter away, so it is somewhere in a sphere with one meter, ma one, one meter radius, so I can go one more meter without colliding with anything. So I move on and execute the uh, function for the next option. Could you take over? And it's half a meter away and then I repeat that until I know I'm there, and this is demoing the 2D case, uh, where you start with P0, and then you get the distance, uh, which corresponds to the radius of this circle, and you repeat this until you've actually hit some surface. And you can also do this in 3D, and through this, very elegantly find uh, some kind of way to phrase this geometry, which you saw, so describing parts of the room and periodically repeating them, for example, and then you can just repeat this function as well. And if you can do this very well, then you can do cool shit like that. So beginning of last year, I also did a small workshop to that. So we're going to link the slides later if, if you want to take a look. And I'm also going to demonstrate how that works and start with uh, the 2D case first, how you draw individual shapes, uh, like defining sh circles, for example, and uh, ascribe colors to them, and then Later, you can have different 2D shapes and kind of merge them. Let's see if I can find a relevant location, like this one. So this is also very easy with this distance function to define this. So you have the centers of the two circles, and then you have this more complex, uh, kind of bouncy or uh, silly putty um, surface. And then from there, you can progress to the 3D space and do pretty much the same thing to have like a cube here with round corners and then uh, kind of build some surface and give it waves maybe and then at the end you repeat this very often and then you have this flight through a complex 3D world with like, I don't know, maybe twice as much code as you can see there to write this. And so both fragment shaders and this ray marching are two approaches to do graphics which I didn't know before and which kind of blew me away and I thought those might interest you as well. If you can do this really well, then something like this might happen. So this is a person called Iku, uh, does this for many, many years and I'll jump ahead to the end. So this is a video where he explains 
how he works and how these demos work, or how his demos work. And so you can see this is almost six hours. It's not a trivial program. So I would like, let's see if I can see an animated version of it. So it's a kind of small, cute figure jumping through a landscape. And the ground is moving and the figure is moving. And so Iku did the same thing, defining a function, which gives you like the distance to the body of a small, the body of the figure. And that's how you can render this. And in general, this person also has a website with very, very good resources to this subject. All right, so much for that. Some years ago, I started to draw a small picture every day and publish it again. And I called them schnipsel, snippets, small snippets that I created every day. And I just wanted to tell you about this a little bit. I've, I, I can't recall really why I started with this. It was a bit about reflecting a bit better of about uh, what you're doing every day. You might feel the same as me. I'm, I tend to start projects and but not finish them really and take them up again a year later. And I had the feeling that I lose the uh, overview about what I'm doing every day. So I found it quite good to reflect at the end of each day what was the most important point in the past 24 hours. And since I like drawing and uh, during studying computer science I, I, I didn't draw as much anymore, I thought I'd just uh, draw snippets it was important for me to finish those rather quickly. I did a little screencast on Twitter lately, how I go about drawing this. So this has to go quickly, just scribbling, I don't take much time. This takes about 10 minutes, maybe a quarter of an hour. And I've got a ThinkPad that has got a integrated digitizer, so I can do this digitally, I don't need any paper, I just try about, I don't even use colors. I I found that I'm really bad at colorizing, so this is really sufficient. Just working in black and white with a little shading, some shading in here. The resolution is just 250 by 250 pixels, which restricts you kind of a bit because you cannot really go into details. Retrospectively, I would have liked to have some... some uh, bigger printouts of that, but for that the resolution is a little bit too too small. And I started posting some of the snippets on Twitter because I post those to my website and uh, I thought nobody is looking at my website. And I thought would somebody look at those snippets if I post them on Twitter and people thought yeah, peop they would look at that. So I started uh, posting that on my Twitter account. And I got quite positive feedback for that. Because from, from time to time, I didn't have time to, uh, to do a daily snippet. And people wrote me, oh, what a pity that you're not drawing, because I'm really looking forward to your daily snippet. Blindry tried that too, one for one month. You can look at that, we'll just click on that, so we can size it up. You did this in a circular way and you also used hexagons at one point. You were playing and experimenting with formats. Blindry uh, also did a monthly review that's all drawn by hand and I find this rather aesthetic, aesthetically. And as I said, I had this running on a bot and a short while ago I, I integrated another API and uh, which didn't handle one kind of error. I went to bed and the bot ran amok and posted the same picture every 10 minutes. In the morning you wake up and look something like this here. Uh, 
Because oh, my inbox was full. Oh my! Oh my God! Your box running, um, uh, your bot is running amok. My whole timeline is uh, full of that. <laughs> and some some posts below that. Huh? She's still sleeping, and the long has been long. And this was even a day where I slept in until ten, and it wasn't so good. But the cool thing is, if you uh, if you draw a snippet every day, you can uh, do a little in joke like this. Uh, with a bot holding a snippet. I like this schnipsel a lot. And this is what I show now. I would recommend to everybody of you to introduce a reflection technique like that. Because you've got days like here at Congress, there's thousands of, uh, thousands of occasions. So you have lots of things going on and you might but still find positive things uh, in a day. And I can still find I can remember much better what happened a month or two months ago because I still know which uh, snippet I drew on that day so try that out who knows if you draw a schnipsel or maybe you'll just write a word a day but I think that's a very nice technology to see what kind of things you're actually doing okay next I want to tell you about mathematical paradoxes which I find really interesting for example, there is something called the interesting number paradox, which says every number is interesting, which is a bit surprising to me at least. So let's prove this together. So it's a proof which goes uh, through reductio ad absurdum. So we take an assumption. So let's assume there are uninteresting natural numbers. Uh, you usually limit this to natural numbers, so not negative whole numbers, but numbers which, which you can count. And let's say there are some which are uninteresting. So you can imagine the number line and there are the ones that are uninteresting are marked. And now we can look at this and see there's one of those uninteresting numbers, which is the smallest one, which the, is the one that's the most on the left of this line. So that's kind of weird. It's a number which is simultaneously not interesting, but this property of being the smallest uninteresting number is, of course, totally interesting. So there's a contradiction there. And if that happens, that means the initial assumption was wrong. So this shows that the assumption can't be right. We assumed that there are uninteresting numbers, and the result is every natural number is interesting. So that's a proof which sounds a bit weird, but there's no trick floor here. There are some proofs with which you can deduce that 1 equals 2 or something. That's uh, rubbish, of course, but this is a pretty solid proof. It's not meant completely seriously, of course, but it holds up to critical scrutiny, at least. And well, I also wanted to say there are also people who try to find this smallest uninteresting number and they use different criteria. There's this online encyclopedia of integer sequences and they look for the smallest number which is not in there, for example, or the smallest number which does not have a Wikipedia article of its own. So I checked recently, that's currently the 262. Is that interesting? I don't know. There's nothing, not much to tell about it so far. The next paradoxon is uh, something about this geometrical object, which is called Gabriel's horn. So this surface is defined such that you take this function 1 divided by x, which is this red number here, so these boxes are one unit long, and we look at a certain area, so we cut this off at position 1, and look at the part to the right. And we take this and rotate it around the x-axis. So that's how you construct this object. So what we get is this very, very pointy uh, going to infinity object, which kind of looks like a horn. And it has a very interesting property, which is the surface area of this object is infinite, which kind of makes sense because it goes infinitely far to the right. And if you try to paint it with color, you would need infinitely much paint uh, because it never runs out. But if you put it, uh, rotate by 90 degrees and try to measure the volume by pouring color into it, you will determine that the 
horn is actually full. The volume is finite, which is a very interesting combination. So if you fill it with paint within, uh, so you can say it's kind of touching the whole surface. But if we paint it, it's still not enough. And well, this paradox with the paint, that sounds a bit weird, but you can resolve this by imagining we don't paint it from outside, we paint it from the inside. Then eventually, as we go to the right into the point, we would get this area where the um, color layer is so thick that it doesn't even fit, because the color layer would also have to become infinitely thin. And if you calculate it like that, it's again finite. So this kind of filling with color works but painting it on the outside needs infinitely much paint. You can resolve it like that. And also this property of the area being infinite and the volume being finite, you can calculate this. You can write down the integrals with this function like one over x, integrate over the duration uh, length and calculate what the area is and you see it's infinite and can get the volume and it's finite. And it's not really intuitive and I could show you the formulas and you might believe it or not. But what I also found is uh, comparison which kind of makes this easier for you so if you imagine you have a piece of silly putty and you form this to a little worm or a cylinder so a cylindrical shape and then you look at the surface of that thing then the surface is going to be roughly the um, circumference of the form of the cylinder times the length so if you like, if you put paper around it, if you roll it up, then you have this rectangle, and one of the lengths is the circumference, and the other one is the length of this snake or worm. And now we take this uh, silly putty, and we roll it up so it's a bit thinner. And what happens is the height is halved, which means the circumference is also halved, but the area. Uh, cross area decreases by a quarter beca but because you haven't changed the volume because you haven't taken anything away it's going to be four times as long so what did we do we have the four times the length and we have half the circumference so the surface of this thing grew by two while the volume stay constant so that means the more thin you make this snake or worm the more this um, ratio of volume and surface changes. And that's exactly what happens with this object, that you make it thinner infinitely much, and so this ratio also grows. And that's how this weird property happens. And similar to that, also with infinity, is the coastline paradox. So that's about measuring the length of a coastline or the borders of a country. And that depends a lot on how exact you do that, how accurate you are. So imagine you have a very long ruler and you put this against the um, border and you go around and you get a number and you could say that's the length and they could, someone could come and say you didn't measure this uh, sufficiently exactly, you would have to use a shorter ruler and then you can go into like little bays. So that's like the difference between the left and the right example, where the right one uses a shorter ruler and use measures the the, the border more accurately, and it depends on that what number you get for the border of this country, and you can continue this as far as you want. So, if you're at the beach of this country and you want to measure the length of the coastline of the line between the beach and the water, you could use a 30 centimeter ruler and lay it down and lay it down again and say, okay, that's 60 centimeters. And then some some life form comes along which is tiny and says you should have measured around each sand corn and uh, measured the gaps and you should have gotten a much longer length and you can continue this as far as you want because the sand grains maybe have little irregularities and if you get down to the atomic level it gets a bit weird but the concept of uh, the length of a coastline or borders of a country is not well defined so mathematicians say that this shape has a fractal dimension larger than one so the more accurately you measure it the more longer it gets and i don't find that especially intuitive and the final paradox i have is the birthday paradox so some of you might know this 
So basically it's about if I look around the room here and look just at the right side, you might be around 30 people, I would guess. And the question of this paradox is how likely is it that two of you have the same birthday, the exact same birthday, and if you want, and if you don't know this yet, you could try to estimate just in percent how likely that would be. Do you have any ideas? Let, so let's assume it's 30 people here. <laughs> it should be pretty high. Someone's saying it's high. And so uh, about 50 percent? Well, I introduced this as a paradoxon, of course, so you might expect that it's something unexpected. So if you're naive, you might think, so there's 365 people, and for some people to have a match shouldn't be that likely. But if you add one person to a group, you have a lot more pairs all of a sudden. So this probability grows larger than you might, faster than you might think. So if you draw the graph like this, on the x-axis the number of people, and on the y-axis the probability that two people have a birthday on the same day. And with 30 people, we're well above 50% already. Uh, so at like 65% or something, which I find surprisingly high. And so 23 people is the limit where the probability is already larger than 50%. So if you want, I don't know if you want, you can try to see if that's actually the case in your group and try to find the people who have birthday on the same day, like group by month or something. We're not going to orchestrate that. But I find this result interesting. Last summer before camp, I wanted to build a fancy chair and I um, thought it should have a nice pattern. And I looked around on the internet and found an interesting paper. It's called Modeling and Visualization of Leaf Venation Patterns. It sounds a bit confused, but it is about the way veins grow in leaves. And they described an algorith algorithm that's fairly simple. And I wanted to show it to you because it gives really great results. This is the kind of result they achieve with it. Um, in example, they let the veins grow rather sparingly, but they become more and more um, uh, complex. And um, eventually, they start closing this kind of loops. And with um, the param parameters you see in G and H, you actually see these kind of larger or smaller cells appearing. And it's not actually this difficult. They um, assume that the shape of the leaf is given and um, the uh, vein that has grown so far is represented by these um, black points. And the red points, uh, red dots are auxins. They are the um, chemicals that uh, determine growth in a leaf and the veins want to grow towards them. Um, so you place these in the leaf and then you find the closest vein point uh, to a given oxine point and each of these connections determines or yeah, the direction in which the vein is going to grow so the point up here is influenced by two points so the mean of these it's actually, oh, it's influenced by three. So it's going to grow towards the mean of these. That's uh, this dot here. It's placed. And in the next step, you check this radius, which is uh, determined by a parameter. And if there's a vein point within that, then the auxine is uh, destroyed. It's basically eaten by the veins and in the next step the leaf has grown and you scale the uh, shape of the leaf up a bit and place new auxine points they initially placed randomly but then you check if two of them are too close to each other there's another parameter for that and if they're too close to each other you um, you uh, you delete it. It's a bit like Poisson disk sampling, and uh, then the whole thing starts from the beginning. You check how many points there are and which of them influence the veins. They can eat these. Uh, the veins can 
eat this oxygen and then you see these branches growing. So I implemented that and it looks like this, for example. If it eventually decides to start playing and what you can see here is that the veins uh, scale up as well. These are two modes they um, have in their simulation and one of them they scale up as well and in another they don't and depending on that you get these lightning shapes or you get these uh, highly branching shapes. I um, implemented that it's not uh, it's not a big deal and you see them in uh, different colors to make it easier to see where these uh, segments are and in the final step I can calculate the size of these veins so if they're more highly branched and of course they're going to be thicker because there's more juice running through them and towards the end they will get thinner and these are results they published in the paper as well I found them interesting on the left they have a photograph and on the right the rendered model bend based on the same motors and you can see how similar the results results are I think they uh, simulated it fairly well and it was supposed to be a chair so I implemented it and um, put it on my uh, CNC it's uh, one that I built myself so it uh, takes a while to uh, machine these and it, it took several hours and I needed two of these parts to create an entire chair so it ended up looking like this I built these uh, squares or I added these squares by hand it's uh, where the legs of the chair are going to be attached and I closed the veins around them to make it more stable and this is what the result looked like the files are online on my website if in case you want to build uh, this kind of chair but uh, what I found out at the end if you have this kind of uh, vein growth then you maximize the surface and this means that uh, the uh, that uh, using sandpaper on this will is going to take a very long while but it turned into a nice chair it was a fun project for the summer summer for generative art um, uh, do you mind if we uh, go over time a bit all right Hi, thanks. I would like to tell you the story of the illegal primes. And all this has to do with DVDs. We've got a few young people in the audience. Uh, somebody of you. Uh, who of you had a DVD in their hands? And who of you didn't have a DVD? Oh, nobody. That's interesting. So we're all on the same page here. So DVDs. <coughs> You might have come across the situation that you had a DVD and wanted to make a safety copy of your DVD and the program of your choice gave you this error message here that the DVD is copy protected and people thought about that problem so that people could not just copy any comp content and they came up with a with a procedure that co that's called content scramble uh, sequence that's uh, that works with uh, secret algorithms and uh, scrambles the the information af according to a complicated algorithm that I have not looked into and they do have they d gave the information on how to encrypt this information to the vendors that provide the the DVDs and well the instructions for decrypting to the manufacturers of playback devices and then they hoped for a while that that people would not do s bad stuff with this for a while and then people sat down and tried to reverse engineer a DVD player how this uh, thing works and what the keys are and they re-implemented this in C CFS descrambling so this is the main function of this procedure and around it in the source code there are some longer tables of numbers which are here called CSS T2 and something and there are some lookups to those but this is the core of it 
and well, other people looked at this and wrote a graphical user interface that made it very e easy for people to copy DVDs. And so some people did not like this. So there were several court cases against the person who wrote the GUI, which was a Norwegian, I believe. And well, it became tricky what exactly you want to make illegal. So how the algorithm works or the keys or what. And then people actually became more creative where the border is between things that should be protected and not. And for example, they produced DCSS the movie. So that's kind of the title scroll of the source code, scrolling through dramatic music through space like Star Wars. So is this an artistic project which is should be protected or is this illegal? Or people did a dramatic reading of the source code. I thought we might listen a bit to this. It's seven minutes, so let's just listen for the first seconds. Sec colon encrypted sector left paren two zero four eight bytes right paren star key colon and so on. So you get the idea. What else happened? People wrote haikus. So not just one, but like I think six hundred of them or so, which describe how the algorithm works. And so the keys are also part of those. So this is a core part of it. So you know haikus, five syllables, sev seven syllables, five syllables. So it's a Japanese classical form of poetry. And you can adhere strictly to that if you enjoy that. And so someone wrote, all we have to do is this, copy our D key into IM1. Use the rule above that decrypts a disk key with IM1 and its friend IM2 as inputs. Thus we decrypt the disk key IM1 and so on, over many, many pages. Is this art? Is this a program? Is this an algorithm? Who knows? And people also printed this onto shirts and onto ties and started wearing this and stuff. And a mathematician sat down and determined this number, which is interesting because if you write it in hexadecimal notation, then it's a zip file, which contains this C program <laughs> and it's a prime which my, makes this so interesting so the trick uh, with which it was found is so with a zip file you can add null bytes at the end as if much as you want without changing meaning of the file so the, they abuse this to with kind of brute force and some rule like what are prime candidates and then check some of them are there actually primes and with one number they had luck and had this prime, which might now be an illegal prime. So this was the first one he found. And later also found one that's approximately twice as long. And that one's interesting because at that point, at the point th where he did this, which was shortly after the year 2000 or something, it was one of the 10 largest prime numbers which were known at all, which made it just through this fact already interesting for publication and it ended up in high score lists of largest primes and ended up on various websites and it's a very nice hack to disseminate this information. Finally a little bit of art, art from the AI field. I don't want to talk about neural nets but just give you a a little bit of uh, feeling for how what's happening there. This is a process or So that's one part of the network where you can throw in an if, if image. And so let's we end up in a space which is called Latin space, which is a kind of very basic representation of images. And I can reverse this to get the original image back. Uh, and I do this in the training phase, so I throw in an image and it processes it, reconstructs it, and I look at the difference and can determine, uh, learn from this and optimize the procedure. But uh, what I can also do is not throw in an image, but 
directly go into this latent space and pick a vector in that latent space, a random one, and let it reconstruct that one, and then let's see what it reconstructs. So those are the procedures you use there. And what I can also do is, supposing I have two images here, on the left this dog, and on the right this, is it a leopard? I think it's a leopard with two weird ears, so something went wrong with the generation in the model, but what you can see, I can create intermediate images, which is uh, funny. So what you did in the 90s with morphing software, now you can do it with neural networks. So I look for these two images in the latent space and then interpolate between them. And then it looks much more interesting than just morphing on picture pixel level, because if you morph on the pixel level, you do a kind of blend from A to B. As you know, in a video game, it's kind of stupid. And here we have a kind of on the content level, a somewhat correct image, and you can render this as a video. Might look like this. Uh, we don't need sound for this. Not that exciting. So the model here is called Big Gun, and so the images were classified in different classes in dogs and flowers. But it didn't use a very didn't use a variation autocoder, so that's different neural structures. But they ha still have this latent space, so you can still do this latent, this interpolation and this morphing. I call it, which happens there, looks extremely fascinating. And what you can also do all of a sudden is uh, vector mathematics in this space. So you can check are there special vectors where I can. Mo which I can move around this point where things happen, or I can look at points in this space and cluster them and say, for example, here we have um, a clustering of ladies who are smiling and ladies who are looking neutral. And now I can say, I take the one point and subtract it from the other one. So smiling woman minus neutral woman becomes neutral man. <laughs> because the woman attribute has been subtracted away, but I can also, at the bottom, do that with sunglasses or with glasses, and say, man with glasses minus man without glasses plus woman with glasses. That's woman with glasses, because I've also subtracted this away, and you can have a lot of fun with this. And because earlier we had it with Twitter bots, there is one more here, which is called the smiling vector bot, which looks for images, and looks for the matching image in latent space and then adds a smile modifier or a smile vector or sometimes subtracts it, depends. And the results are often kind of creepy, but you can scroll through them. So let's click the whole account maybe and see what it posted recently. Oops, okay, so it also posts regularly. I don't know where it gets the images from. Sometimes it also does videos and morphs back and forth there. So what you might have seen as well is Deep Dream. So that's kind of an uh, over-optimization of an image. So you can see here, I think we should also disable sound, it's a bit weird. So here it was done on the video, it's very interesting, and you can already see this was this neural network was trained on images of dogs, so now it thinks of dogs everywhere. And I don't know, I have not tried LSD, does an LSD trip look like this? I would imagine it looked like this, I would say. So it's very trippy and very abstract, and it's very interesting to see where faces and patterns appear. And in this video, you can also see that it's very consistent. So if you do a pan of the camera, then a dog stays in the same place. That uh, with the first attempts, it didn't work like this. If you, when you try to apply neural nets to videos, you had to do some tricks that it stays consistent. Otherwise, it would wobble around way too much. Oh yeah, and something I found a few days ago, which is. Also, this kind of interpolation, but only on cat images. I also thought this was very nice. I also always feel like you can see um, how the positions change, like especially if the body starts wobbling, that's those 
different foot positions which the cat can have, which are, and it starts permuting through those. And I can generally recommend this Twitter account, Roadrunner01. It's kind of doesn't say much, but uh, experiments a lot with neural networks and posts videos, and they're very interesting. And we were at art, so I want to show you more art projects, which I found very impressive in recently. So this is from Helena Serin. She does a lot of things, and it's very impressive that the data sets with which she trains her neural nets, they're always, always her own pictures and drawings. You don't see that very often because people scrape data sets from anywhere or take large picture sets. And she does this with her own data. And then I think she mainly uses GANs and then generates very abstract images. Most of those projects uh, are called Gun Reaver. So they kind of go together like a puzzle. I find that very interesting. And in this case, I think, yeah, it says that here that was a data set from different things uh, with flowering trees and with uh, book pages containing haikus. Another nice project is from Tom White, who exploits uh, neural networks or image recognition software and created this interesting architecture to create these abstract images which can still be recognized from image recognition software. So, I don't know, can you guess maybe what this thing in the middle, uh, upper middle is, what this looks like? Louder? A plane? Yes, it could be a plane, but it's something different. That is based on the model of a shark, um, trained with the model of a shark. Uh, something else that you can guess, the dark blue thing here at the bottom. Yes, that's a hair dryer. Another thing I remember, this was cabbage, and this down here was jack-o'-lantern. So, yeah, Halloween jack-o'-lantern. And I think it's interesting because this is very abstract, but as a human you can still kind of recognize what it uh, represents. And he experiments in this direction as well a lot. Oh, that was too much. We're still here. So three small things at the end from a duo of artists from South Korea, and I'll try to pronounce this correctly. Shin Jong Bak, Kim Jong Hoon are they called, and I hope they don't mind this. So I want to show three show projects. The first one is non-facial mirror, which is a mirror, as you can see soon, with facial recognition, which doesn't want you to look at it, at yourself, in it. Yeah, so does it rotate away from the person? I think it's the other way around. Does it track someone? So that's the uh, other way around. If you can hear someone said in the audience, we have an installation like that here. That's right, I walked past that. I think that's very nice. The examples I have now are all with facial recognition, but they can do other things as well. So here, for example, they put a camera with facial recognition pointed into the clouds. So you might play a game, what can you recognize in the clouds? And they always remember, saved the image when something was recognized in the clouds and printed it. And it's nice because you can often see faces there. And the final project is also very interesting. So they asked other artists to paint a portrait. And the challenge was that a camera is pointed at the canvas from the top with ca facial recognition and the goal was that you cannot recognize it as a person which is not that easy and the artist has a, dis a laptop next to them and could see what was recognized how and there were different algorithms there so you can always see like I, in the green, red, green, blue frame, there were three different algorithms trying to recognize faces. And the artist is suddenly trying to place eyes differently, and sometimes they just put a line straight through it, so you, out of frustration that there's still a face recognizable. And they did this with a lot of artists. They all th got the same portrait, and there are very interesting uh, paintings that happened.
out of that. All right, that were the subjects we brought you today. I hope that it was fun. We have the slides under this URL, and there are also links to the previous versions, the two previous versions of this format, if you find that interesting. Yeah, otherwise, talk to us if you see us walking around. We are on Mastodon and Twitter. And thanks for being here, and have a nice Congress.